Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com, and in my continued series here on messaging, I'm going to be talking about defining a message sender and including that in your messages so that your handlers that are consuming these messages, whether they be command or events, how they can use that information about who the sender is and why they would want to use that information. <laughs> All right, so first let's create our kind of event that we're looking at. And again, this is kind of the same event that I've been working with um, kind of through this series. So I'm just gonna create an inventory adjusted event. And we're gonna have a version, let's call this just 1.0. And we're gonna give it some event data. So we will say that we have a SKU. If you've seen the last couple of videos, this should look pretty familiar. Oops, let's call it uh, quantity. Let's say we've got 10. All right, so we have this event. Now talking about message sender, why do we care about this? So we care about including a sender so we can we identify who sent a message. Um, and if it's a command, obviously it's something that they want to, you know what I mean, change some state in the system, invoke some type of um, action. And if it's event, it's usually gonna be the who have kind of initiated the original command and what you know, I mean what the outcomes are from that the events so the first way we can do this is really just include as simple as you think um, uh, just an ID of some sort whether that be an integer a GUID that's going to be something that represents a user within your system so if your users are just integers it's that if it, they're GUIDs there's that if they're strings whatever the case may be something that's going to be um, unique representation of a user within your system. And why would you want to do this? Well, if you're talking about <clears throat> commands specifically, your users may not have, based on policy and authorization, may not have certain uh, rights to perform certain actions, right? So in your kind of authorization process, you can look at the sender, fetch that information wherever it may be, with it, maybe it's in with an access token, or defining um, roles and access rights. Maybe you need to hit a database for that or some data storage. But at least at this point, you can say, okay, this particular user, they're performing this particular command, can they actually do that? So that's one way is just including the sender ID kind of in this fashion. Another way of doing this though is called an ID token. So an ID token would be something similar of what you would think of maybe as an access token. Um, if I could spell right, so ID token. So this is gonna be some whatever string here. Um, but the idea with an ID token is that this is gonna be something that's gonna have a lifetime. Just so just like access tokens generally have a lifetime, your ID token is gonna have a lifetime. And this is gonna be created to kind of reference when a user authenticated. Uh, so you can look up that ID token generally persisted in cache. So this, instead of having to go look up in your database for with a sender ID, you can use the ID token, which will be, again, generated when a user authenticates and persist in cache kind of their user profile or their access rights, which you can then use, uh, for example, the same purposes for a command if you need to look up what they can actually do. Now, why would you actually want to do this on an event? So if somebody performed a particular action um, and let's say we're, it's a sender ID or ID token, doesn't matter. So again, it's identifying a user. And let's say that a email needs to get sent out. Well, again, you may have rules within your system saying, do we want to send out these particular emails that are event handlers um, if it's this user that caused it? Uh, maybe the answer is no. Maybe you have rules around that. So you still particularly want to um, know who the sender of an event is. So it's not necessarily the system that sent it, and I'll cover that in future topics, or the service that sent it, but rather the particular user. So when I posted the blog post covering this topic earlier in the week, Blake asked me this question on Twitter, and I wanted to cover it here as well because I thought it was an interesting question, is if you're using an event store, and I'm gonna interpret that if you're using an event store, you're talking about event sourcing, uh, but that may not be what he meant, but I wanted to use the example here for event sourcing, is what happens if you later change the permissions on the user and what potential problems that would have? 
Now, it's a good question because if you're talking about event sourcing, you wouldn't care about the, the sender ID or the ID token when you're using event sourcing in the sense that if you're using your events and you're using the historical events and you're replaying them to build current state, you don't care about preventing actions because things have happened. If things have happened in the past, and that's a record of um, like state transitions, they have happened. You have to apply them. So if you're rebuilding state from all the different events that have occurred in a system or for, for a particular aggregate or entity, there's no need to do any type of authorization because they've already occurred. So you wouldn't need to use the sender ID for any type of validation. But on the first part is, would you reject it if we're just talking about generally for the sender? If you're talking about commands, then yeah, you could reject um, a command. You might not accept it if you're talking about a HTTP API or something like that. And again, on the event side, you're more using it to determine whether you should or shouldn't do anything. And like, again, my example was, so you needed to set, send an email out based off of some event that have, that's occurred um, that you're processing kind of almost immediately. Maybe you don't want to do it depending on who kind of initiated that whole event to begin with. So appreciate the question. If you have questions, I'd love to hear about them in the comments um, or let me know on Twitter. Thanks. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and please subscribe for more software architecture related videos.